Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jack Daly, director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, and it's my honor to welcome you to the Stephen F. Udvarhazy Center for tonight's program, Innovations Towards Vi Invisibility, CIA's Oxcart Project A-12 Reconnaissance Air Air Aircraft. Here at the National Air and Space Museum, we emphasize that we are one museum with two locations. When we opened the Udvarhazy Center in 2003, we had less than a third of the artifacts that are on display today. Now there are over 300 aircraft and spacecraft and hundreds of smaller artifacts. Even though the current uh, exhibition space exceeds 350,000 square feet, we are continuing to expand. Construction of phase two at, the, at this center will be completed later this year and the move-in will progress through 2011. The new wing of the center will be devoted to the care and storage of the Smithsonian's aeronautical and space history collections. It will contain the major Mary Baker Eddy, Mary Baker Engen restoration hangar, the archives, the Emil Bueller conservation lab, and, uni and units for collections and processing and storage. In phase two, museum visitors will have the opportunity to learn how artifacts are preserved. From a mezzanine overlooking the hangar, you will be able to watch the specialist restoring and caring for artifacts. The new archives will be spacious a facility outfitted with modern equipment where researchers will have access to 12,000 cubic feet of documents in the world's most complete collection of historic aviation space images. The establishment of the collections and archives divisions in the new wing of the Udvarhazy Center will signal the beginning of the transition from the Paul E. Garber facility in Suitland, Maryland, where aviation artifact processing, preservation, and storage has occurred since the 1950s. With the addition of phase two, the expansion of the National Air and Space Museum will be complete. Combined, the museum's two locations will consist of 700,000 square feet of exhibition space, uh, plus two IMAX theaters, a planetarium, an observatory, two restaurants, two stores, simulators, classrooms, learning labs, and several reception areas. And we'll be able to do even more programs, such as the one scheduled for this evening. Until 2007, the individuals who built and flew the Oxcard A-12 a mysterious high-speed, high-altitude reconnaissance aircraft were known only as secret heroes of the Cold War. Just two and a half years ago, their identities were declassified. Tonight, you will meet them and hear about their work in the Central Intelligence Agency's top secret project, Oxcart. Our moderator for tonight's program is the chief historian for the CIA. He received his PhD in American history from Columbia University. He later taught at Columbia and worked at the uh, Gannett Center for Media Studies there. In 1989, he joined the CIA as a political and leadership analyst on the Middle East. He has written articles and book reviews on CIA leaders, counterintelligence, covert action, and technical collection for several publica publications. He's taught intelligence history at George Mason University here in Virginia, and also has written biographies of Central Intelligence Director John McCone and Chief Justice John Marshall. It is my pleasure to introduce Dr. David Robard. David. How does this get fired up? touch it, right? Very good. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I really appreciate you coming out on this evening to hear what I hope will be a fascinating story, one that in some ways is characteristically American because it involves the application of money and brains and technology to answer a pressing national security problem. Haven't we been there before? <laughs> what we're dealing with here is a terrific story of aviation and engineering and intelligence, all fused together to accomplish a, an important national objective, protecting the national security from an unknown threat, that of Soviet strategic annihilation. And in order to do that, we had to concern ourselves with finding out what was going on behind the Iron Curtain. We did not have intelligence agents behind there. It was a tough security state, a very rigorous uh, internal police system. We did not have the right people in the right place at the right time to answer the big question. What did the Soviets have and what were they going to do with it? So we turned to technology. 
We started out with the U-2 aircraft, which worked admirably, starting with its first missions in June of 56 and its first overflight of the Soviet Union in July of 1956. But we knew that its days were numbered because it was tracked from the very first mission. And eventually, one of them was going to be shot down. So people at the CIA, people in, uh, at Lockheed, which had helped us develop the U-2, decided to try to come up with something brand new. Not just a marginal improvement in a reconnaissance platform, but an aircraft that was a generation ahead. And indeed, even when it went out of service, it remains a generation or more ahead of anything uh, in the air today. This became a pressing problem when Francis Gary Powers' U-2 was shot down in May of 1960. And as a result, you had an impetus granted to the Oxcart program, as it came to be called. It was originally developed in 1959, started out as uh, a very experimental program with a variety of platforms being developed, reconnaissance uh, vehicles of different types. And consequently, we had to do something uh, imminently because the satellites were not coming up either. We had a corona program as the code name went, and that was still not online fully reliable either. So the effort was joined with CIA and with the Lockheed Corporation, run by uh, Kelly Johnson a brilliant aircraft engineer who had developed some of the most important uh, aircraft over the years, probably America's most remarkable aviation genius. And as a result, we have the successful Oxcart program coming into uh, production in the early 1960s. A rigorous test schedule, a rigorous uh, development schedule, lots of uh, important work going on out at the Skunk Works in Lockheed. And you'll hear from it tonight from a variety of people who worked on different aspects of the program. Individuals who were at Lockheed with Kelly Johnson, people who were uh, involved in developing some of the engine components and the engines themselves, people who worked on stealth and spoofing of the aircraft, and also uh, individuals who flew the aircraft and went off on the intelligence missions. And during the question and answer period, we're also going to hear a bit about uh, the photo interpretation that went on, because after all, this is an intelligence collection platform. It's not just a nice, fancy, flat, fast, high aircraft, but rather it's there to collect secret information for war fighters and policymakers. It was a tough haul. Uh, unlike the U-2, which came in on time and under budget, the technological challenges confronted by the A-12 designers and testers were much more intricate. It took a lot of innovation, a lot of uh, agility, a lot of cleverness. And it's uh, a real credit to everybody who was involved with the program that they surmounted some amazing technological challenges, which we'll point out to you uh, during the presentation today. When the aircraft is finally deployed on operational missions in 1967, its target had changed entirely. Instead of overflying the Soviet Union, it is now being used really as a tactical collection platform in a semi-conventional war in Vietnam. Now, the A-12 itself flew, surprisingly, for only one year, or even less than that, barely 11, uh, a little more than 11 months. At the same time that the A-12 is being developed, the SR-71 is coming online, and I hope many of you have had the chance to see the, the beautiful aircraft that's here at the museum. The SR-71, in a sense, is the legacy aircraft for the A-12 because it continued to fly until 1989, uh, putting in over 3,500 missions all over the world before its deactivation uh, in 1989. And I hope later on we'll hear from one of the pilots of an SR-71 to talk about uh, some of the aspects of that program. These are the basic technological challenges that the people at Lockheed and the scientists who worked at CIA had to confront. The whole point of the aircraft was to make it fly so high and so fast that it was not only hopefully invisible through its small radar cross-section, but invulnerable. And indeed, it proved to be the case over the years. Not a single A-12 or SR-71 was shot down in the better part of 3,600 missions. How did you get to this? extreme in technological advancement. You had to deal with some amazing 
novel problems, working with a metal that was very difficult to mold and cut and shape and even drill holes in. You had to develop a special fuel. You had to develop new wiring, new tires. The engine, as you'll hear, was a, a, an immense challenge eventually overcome. All sorts of innovations involved here and lots of frustrations uh, as well. In order to get the minimal cross-section, the aircraft gradually took on that amazing cobra-like shape with the chines and the sleek edges and the interesting use of composites and special paint and other developments. And as you'll hear, I hope, from uh, one of the pilots here, it also was a big effort to make the aircraft reliably flyable in the air because it had a, a disturbing tendency to flame out on you when you're going about Mach 2.8 or so. And boy, that must have been a wild ride. Uh, this is eventually resolved with that very distinctive pointed inlet in the engines, which moves back and forth over two feet to help control the airflow and prevent those, uh, those flame outs. The uh, endearing feature, the uh, drippy fuel tanks, uh, never fully solved. It was a uh, factor that you simply couldn't deal with because of the special chemistry of the fuels. But thankfully, the aircraft expanded uh, a few inches in flight, and the fuel tanks sealed themselves, uh, for the most part, anyway. Kelly Johnson, a brilliant man, uh, designer of the P-38, uh, the F-80, the Constellation, uh, commercial aircraft, many others, uh, really uh, the, the crux of the program, the heart and soul of the program. And I'd like to introduce to you, uh, to speak about working out at Lockheed with Kelly Johnson, uh, Robert Murphy, who was a, an industrial manager at Lockheed for over 30 years, and the principal manager under Kelly Johnson, dealing with uh, not just the A-12, but the U-2 and the SR-71. And Mr. Murphy is going to describe for us, I hope, um, what it was like to work with Kelly. What is the Kelly Johnson way? Why could this wonderful project not have been accomplished anyplace else except at Lockheed? Mr. Murphy. Well, number one, uh, his uh, favorite statement was, keep it simple, stupid. Uh, uh, in 1943, when the Germans were uh, pushing 262s around with jet engines and shooting down B-17s, the Air Force got a little excited. They called Kelly up to right field. Uh, he showed uh, some sketches he had made of a jet fighter if they'd furnished the engine. And uh, he said, uh, you give me the contract, I'll uh, design and build the airplane in 183 days and fly it. And uh, the general says, well, you don't have to wait. Uh, he said, uh, at 1 o'clock this afternoon, I'll hand you a letter of intent. There will be an airplane waiting to fly you to Burbank, and we'll call this day one. <laughs> well, uh, Kelly fooled the hell out of him because he flew it in, in uh, 143 days. And uh, that became the P-80, which was our first production jet. And that was the start of what is known as the Skunk Works. Now, on that program, there was about uh, 18 to 20 engineers total. And uh, as they moved past that airplane uh, to the T-33, uh, the uh, F-94, uh, the F-90, the 104, the C-130, and so forth. Our job was to build the first two airplanes, do the flight test, and then turn the production over to the uh, regular company. Uh, Kelly uh, would always set some date for the first flight date, and that was in stone. And uh, these same engineers, or the majority of them, moved along on each one of these programs. In other words, the, the engineer who designed the wings for the P-80, his name was Bob Wheelie, also designed the wings for the A-12 and all the other airplanes in between, all by himself. Now, in a normal company environment, including Lockheed, they would have an army of engineers designing that and draftsmen and blueprint checkers and all kinds of things. The first production airplane we did completely was the U-2 eight months from money to first flight. Flight test, and that was in July. Flight test 
had met all the requirements by November. We'd been over 70,000 feet. We'd taken pictures, uh, flown around the United States, started to train the pilots, and launched the first group overseas in April. So 22 months, or uh, 14 months after a go ahead. So then uh, we moved on to the uh, A-12. Well, when Kelly uh, heard that the Russians had spotted, could tell the airplane was there on the first flights over the Soviet Union of the U-2, he immediately started a vulnerability study. And he came to the conclusion himself that to fly safety safely over the Soviet Union, uh, you would have to fly above 80,000 feet and above Mach 3. And he started uh, making drawings and diagrams and so forth of uh, what he thought might work, from ramjets to balloons. Believe it or not, the, that's what the uh, people who were trying to compete with this idea was, was to fly an airplane, or take a dirigible to take an airplane up to 100,000 feet and light ramjet jet engines. The uh, balloon would have been two miles long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, uh, Kelly dealing with uh, Mr. B, as we called him in those days, Mr. Bissell was the program manager on the U-2, that uh, he agreed we'd use the same rules that uh, we used on the U-2. On the A-12, he thought he could fly it in about uh, 20 months. Uh, everything on it had to be invented, everything. He had a little bet, 50 cents, anybody would find something that we could use without being invented, uh, he'd win. Uh, <laughs> These engineers, and, and the secret of the skunk works that he wanted to do that he did, was there was no staff people, no blueprint checkers, no consultants and uh, Johnny come lately's. The engineers, the production people, the purchasing people were all in the same building on the same floor. The, engineer would draw his part of the airplane, he'd bring it out to the supervisor who was going to build that part. And then the supervisor would do it. If he had a problem, he'd call the engineer who could be out there in five minutes, he would make a red mark change on the drawing and proceed. There was never any delay, didn't get to have to get improved by anybody else. So the, we had eight managers. Uh, one for the forward fuselage, one for the aft fuselage, one for fabrication, one for plumbing, one for electrical. That was me, electrical plumbing and controls. He immediately started a test program on the material, the titanium material. The first 90% we got was scrapped. Uh, we found uh, we had built some, uh, like a wing test section, which is flat skin and a nose section. And, um, and put them in an oven and heated them up to what they'd be at flight. By the way, the coolest part on the outside of the airplane at cruise is the same temperature you can get your oven, 450 degrees. That's the coolest part. So when they did the wing test, the whole thing just collapsed because the uh, metal expanding just tore itself to pieces. That's why when you look at the airplane, you'll see the airplane's core, uh, wing skins are corrugated, and it takes the stress out. Uh, the uh, cockpit was a disaster in the first test. Uh, so they jumped right on it and fixed it. The, uh, we had a full-size uh, mock-up, or not a mock-up, a usable fuel system, same size as the fuselage. Fuselage has six, seven tanks, and you could raise and lower it and so forth. Meanwhile, the sheet metal, uh, we uh, had to work with Timet on getting the alloys right. And uh, every sheet that, of material that came in, we had to know w which direction it was rolled in and so forth. We cut eight coupons off, little coupons, 
in Benham and played with them to see if the material was any good. And then those coupons traveled with the parts made out of that sheet to verify it. So we, we ran into so many problems, but the secret of the Skunk Works, the problems were solved by the people doing the work. We didn't send it to outside laboratories or uh, some genius. Uh, we had to invent the cutting oil to machine machine parts. And the shop guys working with the engineer Kelly assigned to it came up with the stuff. Uh, we found out uh, to form the complicated parts, we had to preheat the form blocks to 1800 degrees and then put the part to be compressed or made into whatever they were going to do on an 8,000 pound press or 1800 pound press and hold it and depending on the size of the part, how long we held it. Because if you didn't hold it long enough, as soon as you took it out of the thing, it went like this, instead of what it was supposed to be. So it was a lot of work, but all the people who solved it were right there. Now, I said we had about 18 to 20 engineers on the uh, P80, a few more on the U2, maybe 25, and on the A12, probably 100, 125. Now, to give you an example, in a normal environment, the uh, North American B-1 had 5,000 engineers. I don't know how the hell you coordinate 5,000 engineers. Because our engineers sat just like this, facing each other. They were working on drafting boards. Right? No computers, everything with a slip stick. And, and that's true. And if you were into Kelly and uh, you were talking about a problem, he opened his door and pulled out his, what he called his Michigan computer, which is a slide rule, <laughs> and uh, took care of it. One of the big problems to overcome was the uh, hydraulics. Uh, to get some hydraulic fluid that stand 800 degrees and lubricate, uh, Kelly actually had one company send him a sample, said it'd do it. It was a solid. But when you heated it, it melted. Well, that doesn't make very good hydraulic fluid. Uh, but finally, he got some made, and we made some additives to it in-house. And uh, when you got the airplane together, this is a little ahead of, uh, to test it for leaks, you had a gig that heated the oil to 500 degrees when you put it in the airplane to see if it had any leaks. Uh, the electrical wiring at the beginning was a disaster. It just wasn't wire made to uh, stand the temperatures that this airplane was going to fly at. Uh, the windshield was, uh, you know, like uh, 1,400 degrees. The, the uh, pinpoint, the glass was about 450. The guys say they heated their sandwiches when they put it on the window. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not. But the key was everybody was right there. There were no staff people. Everybody knew their job. They were all very experienced. The, the core of engineers were ones that had been in the skunk work since the 40s and uh, uh, knew what they were doing. And uh, we just pressed on. We, we, you, you had a problem. You had to get it solved as quickly as possible. And we had plenty of them. Uh, machining the parts was really difficult. Later, when they made a press strong enough to make near net forgings, it saved a lot of money and a lot of, a lot of uh, time. But uh, the A-12s were all built with built up parts, and uh, the SR-71s after the sixth airplane, we used a lot of forgings. Uh, Kelly uh, had the unique deal uh, of walking around the shop and walking around engineering. Uh, he'd go to a guy's board and he'd talk to him about how he's coming with the design, any problems or so forth. So that's where walk around management was invented and I used it the rest of my life. Hardly anybody spent any amount of time in the office. Everybody was out working on the floor, making things happen. And uh, that's what made it happen. Uh, I was trying to think of uh, uh, 
some other problems. Uh, well, Bob, one of the uh, fascinating aspects of it, as you mentioned earlier, was the difficulty of getting good quality titanium. Right. And uh, one of the ironies built into the program was the CIA developed a covert procurement program in order to acquire quality titanium from the best source of it uh, in another country. And uh, which country do you think that might have been? <laughs> right. <laughs> Russia. Okay, uh, a few other uh, deals on that line. Uh, we started these test programs on everything. In fact, Kelly uh, made a comment at one time. He says, I thought for a while all we were doing is making tests, but we weren't. Uh, it looked like it, but we weren't. And uh, the, the work between the shop and the engineering was fantastic. They've known each other for years. Uh, they could s solve problems a very short period of time and press on. Uh, we uh, had a, a static test uh, rig built up, ready to go, in the same building. Uh, Kelly, by the way, when the vulnerability studies of uh, the Russians had spotted the airplanes started a, a stealth lab. There was a few engineers totally designed to stealth. And we practiced on the U-2, it didn't work what we thought of then, and they just kept, kept pressing on until we got to the A-12, mm -hmm. and uh, they made it pretty stealthy. Let's uh, move on to the next okay. uh, general subject here, which is exactly that, uh, stealth and spoofing. You have an aircraft that can fly, as we see here, at Mach 3.2 plus, which is literally faster than a speeding bullet, and at 90,000 feet. And collectively, the Oxcart aircraft uh, were the, remain really, the highest flying, fastest piloted jet aircraft ever made. Nothing has really ever approached it. And it's remarkable, given the technological challenges that Bob has recounted, how successful it has been over the years. One interesting aspect of it that hasn't gotten as much attention, though, is the idea of hiding it in plain sight, in effect, through stealth and spoofing technology. And Gene Poteet, our next speaker, is going to address that question. Gene uh, has spent his uh, professional life as an electronics engineer and physicist and missile guidance engineer. And he was recruited to work on the A-12 under the agency's first director of science and technology, uh, Bud Whelan. And worked on this particularly uh, stellar effort to create stealth technology that proved to be the forerunner for a number of further advances later on over the years. Again, another uh, amazing legacy from the A-12 program. Gene. Thank you, David. One of the most secret aspects of the A-12 Oxcart program was the fact that it was to be the very first truly stealth airplane, completely invisible to radar. But the concept of stealth aircraft is as old as radar itself. It turns out toward the end of World War II, the Germans had the same idea to build a stealth aircraft, and it was known as the Hitler's Stealth Bomber, and you see pictures of it up here. But the plane never was quite finished before the end of the war, so the Americans captured the uh, original uh, uh, aircraft in parts and also the uh, detailed plans. And the, the Air and Space Museum completed the model that you see in these pictures. Uh, it was called the Horton HO229. Uh, it was also one of the most beautiful airplanes you've ever seen. I'm sure you see that there. The plane was covered with a radar absorbing paint and they used uh, a lot of carbon embedded in wood glue to help absorb the radar signals, had a high graphic uh, content. Now the theory of stealth is well known as long as radar, and that dealt with the shape of the aircraft to deflect the radar signal rather than reflect it back to the radar itself. And then of course the radar absorbing material, which we called it uh, RAM, R-A-M. Now, after the U-2 had been shot down in the traumatic experience that President Eisenhower had uh, with that particular incident, 
he came to the CIA and said uh, that A-12 Oxclart will not fly over the Soviet Union until you prove to me that it is in fact invisible to the Soviet radars. I was called into the office and said, Gene, you've got a new job. And they explained what I had to do, find out if the Soviet radars could see a stealth airplane. I might add, I took the rest of the day off and went home. I had no idea where to start. But nonetheless, we did, uh, after some thought, and we had the world's leading scientists behind us, we came up with a way to electronically inject signals into the Soviet radars, and then we, they would simulate uh, an airplane flying into the, that radar. And then we had an NSA team of communications experts that could speak Russian, Spanish. They could listen to the Russian radar operators, and we could know if they could, uh, if they could actually see that uh, blip on the radar screen. And we could vary the size of our electronic airplane to simulate a giant bomber or a small bird or anything in between. So we could simulate the A-12 Oxcart radar size injecting that into the uh, Russian radars. Now, the, uh, we had uh, the other part of that same program was we had a series of Air Force planes that were flying laboratories. We measured every detail about Russian radars. We knew their power, their patterns, and so on. As a matter of fact, when we got through, we knew far more about the Russian radars than they did themselves. The interesting thing, though, was we ran these operations around the, the world. We did these uh, spoofing electronic uh, tricks, if you will, from islands near Soviet ma uh, radars. Uh, we conducted operations from ships at sea, and then we con conducted some of these operations from submarines with just our antenna sticking above the water, and then we could transmit our signals in it. And when the Russians moved into Cuba with their latest radars during the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, we, we were so pleased because we now can operate uh, instead of in the Arctic, we could operate in our backyard in the warm weather. Uh, but uh, we were running an operation one night when uh, the, uh, the uh, Russian and Cuban fighters launched to intercept this aircraft that was, <laughs> was not up there. And uh, on one particular night, uh, we had a lot of fun. We could, we could always keep ahead of the pursuing aircraft fighter planes just by uh, manipulating our controls to keep ahead of him. And it was not very, but we had a lot of fun doing it. But then one night we heard a Cuban fighter pilot uh, call his ground controller and say, uh, I have the intruding aircraft in sight. <laughs> and we're looking around and, and then after a while he said to the ground controller, I would like permission to shoot him down. And, uh, you know where we're going with this by now. Uh, the ground controller gave him approval to shoot down this intruding aircraft. And by now we're all standing up and leaning over this console electronics that we had built. And uh, then the pilot said, uh, we're gonna start, I'm gonna start my firing run now. And then we waited a second and our technician put his hand on the on off switch and I said, yes, turn it off. And then, uh, silence for a while and the ground controller called the pilot back and said, you must have got him. He disappeared off of our radar screen. <laughs> <laughs> but the pilot never said a word in response. Uh, nonetheless, we, we got uh, all the answers we needed and unfortunately, we learned that the Soviet radars, especially their modern long range uh, early warning radars could in fact detect the ox cart and track it very well. But we also knew something else. Uh, and by the way, they, we learned how small of a target that uh, you had to be to be invisible and not make a blip on that radar screen. And we turned that information uh, back over to Lockheed. And with that information, they were able to build uh, in more advanced uh, stealth aircraft like the F-117, which could in fact 
fly right through those radars and not be detected. But more important, what we did was we learned a lot of tricks about getting technical information about Soviet complex systems. Uh, we were even able to locate every radar in the Soviet Union and pinpoint it so we could help in case there was a war. Uh, we actually turned a 60-foot antenna on the New Jersey Turnpike, pointed it at the moon, and waited for 30 days. We eventually could pick up the Soviet radars when they re were reflected off of the moon. So we were able to plot the location of every radar. But the main thing is that we, uh, we came up with, with a new type of technique of getting technical intelligence. We would go anywhere in the world, mount any kind of operation necessary to get the information we needed. And those projects that we began in the early 1960s continue to this day, mostly under the control of National Security Agency, and they're very helpful to our tactical people. We can now build better electronic jammers to protect our people. But anyway, the point is we change the way that uh, technical intelligence is collected. We don't passively wait on it. We go get it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. <laughs> the reason why the A-12 and the SR-71 are the highest flying, fastest piloted jet aircraft ever made is because of the engines, the J-58 uh, Pratt & Whitney engine. And we have with us tonight the man who worked for Pratt & Whitney for many, many years and is really the, one of the key individuals along with other people like Bill Brown and Ben Rich, whom you'll hear about perhaps, uh, who came up with the technical fixes to turn a difficult engine into a reliable one, one that could produce the necessary thrust and power. Uh, you, you have to keep in mind we're dealing with a power plant that is by itself more powerful than the engine room of a transoceanic liner. The Queen Mary, in effect, the engine room of the Queen Mary hangs from each wing of an A-12 or an SR-71, 160,000 horsepower, an immense amount of power uh, out of that plant. A lot of technical challenges to overcome to get that kind of thrust. And uh, Bob Abernathy from Pratt & Whitney uh, will explain how he was able to do that. Uh, yes, I'd like to say that, uh, take you back a half a century at that time, which I call the golden age of aerospace. Um, our gentleman from Lockheed has indicated some of this to you, but it was a wonderful experience because each young engineer, like myself at the time, had enormous responsibilities. But the best part was communications. We had direct access to the top people. So if I found a problem, I could go immediately to Bill Brown, um, Kelly's buddy, um, and uh, explain it to Bill and propose a solution. And um, Bill at that point would pick up the red crypto phone on his desk and call Kelly. They talked every day. And uh, that, by that means, the communication, I think, was a big part of the success of the program. Now, we did everything in those days with slide rules. I carried one on my belt in a holster and a little six-inch one here in my shirt pocket. It was like my do doctor with a stethoscope. Um, we wouldn't go anywhere without the, the slide rules. So one day, my boss called me in the office. He said, I want you to build a computer program of the J-58 engine. I said, what's a computer? <laughs> he explained that um, we were about to get this computer and um, at United Technology Research in East Hartford, and I would be flying back and forth um, with a computer analyst. Um, and I did that throughout the winter of 58 and 59. And we finally developed a computer program, the J-58 engine. And my computer analyst went on to become a priest. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lot of fun. Um, but um, when I took a look at the, uh, the 
mechanics of a computer program. I had to model a compressor, the, the uh, diffuser, the burners, the turbine, all of the components, and the afterburner. And it was very clear to me that the compressor would be deep in surge, bang, 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 stalling um, at Mach 3, if we ever got there. Uh, the other components looked pretty good, except for the afterburner. The afterburner was just going to melt. There was no way near enough cooling flow to cool the afterburner. Well, one way out of, to get the compressor out of surge that Pratt and Whitney liked was to open mid-stage bleeds, bleed air out of the compressor, increasing the airflow through the front stages, taking them out of stall and flutter. And um, that sounded like a good idea, but you'd lose tons of performance if you dump that air overboard. So my idea was to put ducts in and connect the mid-stage of the compressor with the afterburner and use that air to cool the afterburner. And that's exactly what we did. If you see a picture of the J58 engine, there are six ducts about this big around, uh, bypassing about 20% of the flow uh, into the um, afterburner and cooling it. Uh, thermodynamically, this made the engine into a partial ramjet, operating the afterburner as a ramjet for that air that bypassed it. Um, I thought, my calculations, um, that it would um, increase the thrust um, perhaps 20%. Uh, what I didn't realize was that Kelly Johnson's supersonic inlet was starved for airflow. And by increasing the airflow, I dramatically improved the performance of the inlet. And in Mach 3, most of the thrust comes from the inlet, not the engine. Of course, you need the engine to suck down the inlet. But most of the thrust is actually in the inlet. And so by increasing the um, airflow by 20%, <clears throat> I improved the supersonic inlet performance so much that we actually got a 50% increase in thrust and a 20% reduction in fuel consumption. And uh, that's how it worked. Uh, my calculations on my slide roll uh, indicated we might get to uh, 85,000 or 90,000 feet, and we could probably exceed Mach 3, three times the speed of sound. Uh, I thought maybe we could get to Mach 3.2, and as you've heard, that turned out to be the cruise point Mach 3.2, 85, 90,000 feet uh, for the Blackbird. So um, we had a lot of fun, a lot of fun. <laughs> it was a great time, and I was privileged to be there. I don't think it's quite as much fun today from what I understand. <laughs> today there are layers and layers of oversight committees. In those days, I could walk into Bill Brown's office and he'd pick up the phone and call Kelly. And there wasn't any of this, uh, more or less, the Air Force let Bill Brown and Kelly build the U-2, which they did, and then they built the Blackbird together as partners uh, without the oversight that we have today. It was a lot of fun. I was privileged to be there. Thanks, Mark. The development of the Oxcart aircraft was a true partnership among the agency and the contracting community and the U.S. Air Force, and we need to recognize the indispensable role the Air Force had in the success of the program. There was a special component of the Air Force created just for Oxcart, the 1129th Special Activity Squadron. You always know you're dealing with something spooky when you see the word special in government nomenclature. These were several hundred Air Force personnel devoted to the project, both at the Nevada test site and at the various bases and fuel depots around the world. Most of the action later on, for reasons we'll explain later, was at Kadena Air Base in Okinawa. But one of the biggest challenges with the aircraft was simply keeping it in the air with fuel because it burned it at enormous rates, 22,000 pounds per hour per engine. 
It had to be refueled anywhere from two to four times in flight, depending on the length of a mission. And this was an intricate process involving prepositioning of tankers and fuel supplies, all of that carried out by the 1129th Special Activities Squadron. So a bow to the Air Force for the uh, indispensable support for it. Well, who's inside this wonderful aircraft? Various pilots who had to meet their own high performance specifications. A bit of a contrast to the profile of the U-2 pilot, uh, here you have uh, a rather different sort of people with the really the right stuff. Uh, highly trained, qualified to fly the fastest and best and most modern aircraft that the U.S. had produced, meeting other various kinds of criteria. And it was a tough scrub. Initially, only five made it through the uh, screening process. Uh, we went back, dipped in a little bit deeper, got a good set of crew, and eventually six of them uh, became the core of the Oxcart program. Regrettably, two were killed in the course of the program, only one because of apparently some kind of catastrophic failure with the aircraft. This was Jack Weeks who was killed, I think even more tragically, on a checkout flight before returning an aircraft home after the project was canceled. The other fatality was Walter Ray, who was killed when he bailed out and his chute did not deploy, and he fell 30,000 feet to his death. Other than that, the aircraft was immensely reliable, and the pilots came to love flying it, though it was an enormous challenge. Uh, ben Rich, who helped develop the engines for the aircraft, referred to it as a wild stallion that was almost untamable. But eventually, people like our speaker tonight, Ken Collins, did exactly that. He's the only pilot uh, now who's uh, flown both the A-12 and the SR-71. He flew six missions on the A-12 program called Black Shield, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. And he's here to tell you what it was like to break this wild stallion. <laughs> Thank you. There were times when that's absolutely true. <laughs> Very quickly, uh, I began in Lockheed's first and uh, finest at the time, the F-80. And I checked out, got out of pilot's training in February 52 and August of 52, I was flying combat missions over North Korea in the F-80. It was probably about the slowest, I guess, reliable airplane. But anyway, did that, went through other, I uh, got into the RF-80, RF-101, and, uh, which was a fine airplane, and we used that as the trainer when we finally got to uh, our destination for, to fly the A-12. We, when I, I was asked if I would volunteer for a space program. And I said, yeah, what's it supposed to do? He said, well, you just, all you need to know is do you want to volunteer, yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I guess young and naive, I volunteered and uh, I left Shaw Air Force Base, South Carolina, went to Washington and they said, uh, go to California and someone will see you out there. I said, well, what is I'm going to do? He said, well, you're going to fly an airplane. I said, I'd like to see a picture of it. They said, no, you can't do that. It was classified. So uh, I did go to California in uh, October of uh, 60 or 62. Went up to uh, this area where uh, Doug Nelson, who became a very good friend of mine and uh, an SR pilot, uh, I talked to him and he says, well, let me take you over here to this hangar and I'll show you the airplane. He still didn't tell me what it was. And the old hangars had windows up at the top, big old rolling doors, you know, that opened up wide enough for an airplane to slide in and out. And uh, he opened up the little people door, and we walked in, and you've seen the SR-71 out here and how beautiful it is. And the light was shining through, the sun on top of this thing, and it just, you know, really black was beautiful. That was the most fantastic thing, exotic thing, I'd ever seen in my life. Beautiful. In February, I got my first ride in our trainer. The trainer happens to be in the Science Museum in the Los Angeles area right now, uh, mounted, you know, on a pedestal sort of thing. When we were flying, starting the uh, A-12, there had to be, if you're going to fly at Mach 3 consistently and, and very smoothly, you had to have Dr. Bob's engine married totally with the inlet and with the afterburner. They were totally separate components by different people. Uh, what happened if it didn't work just great together, you had what they called, and we, we coined new phrases all the time, an on-start, aerodynamic disturbance. 
And it what the spike was supposed to do was move back 26 inches into the nacelle, capture the shock wave at the throat of the engine, and bypass around these big tubes that Dr. Bob had talked about, back into the afterburner, and essentially you got 85% from the inlet, not the engine, and through the afterburner, 85% uh, of the thrust. Fantastic. When w once we got there, it, it was fantastic. It's probably the most amazing engine and airplane that you've ever had. Only engine airplane that's ever flied, flown sustained afterburner. That's a manned aircraft, sustained afterburner. Most aircraft that have uh, afterburners, they fly 30 minutes, and if you go over that, you're probably going to burn the engine up. <clears throat> we had a lot of problems in the, the marrying of these, the spike, the inlet, which is the spike, and the afterburner and the engine. And if you had a disturbance that caused a problem in the left engine, it was like hitting a telephone pole. You, the right engine was still going full power, and you hit this thing, and all of a sudden you compressed and stalled the engine, you blew the afterburner out, and the spike was, it was somewhere wandering around there, and you hit two switches, and that fired both spikes forward, and you hope you got symmetrical thrust. You might be 60, 70,000 feet, and two minutes later you were at 20,000 feet. You were just falling. Uh, <clears throat> it was rough. They had cameras on, over our shoulders looking at, they don't always believe the pilots, you know, we're all honest. <laughs> it, look, over looking at the instruments because you couldn't see everything all at the same time. And during one of the on-starts and severe on-starts, uh, my shoulders broke out the lens out of both cameras. One of the other pilots in, uh, during the test, the experimental testing that we did, his visor that he had on his helmet, not the main visor, but the shade was cracked by bouncing back and forth on the canopy. Uh, they mentioned the uh, temperature right at the cockpit was 650 degrees. The original uh, pressure suit we had uh, had a silver coating on it to reflect the heat. We had air conditioning uh, pumped into the suit itself, and we had air conditioning into the cockpit. A lot of the air conditioning and the cooling of the whole airplane was through the fuel, if you can imagine. It recycled the fuel through the engine and back out again and back into the engine and as you were burning it. <clears throat> I was adjusting a sun visor at altitude because it's very bright sun, at the 80,000 feet, and I moved the sun visor with my silver-coated hand glove, and uh, I looked up there, and there's a smear on the side of the canopy, and what it had done is melted the silver off of the glove. So it's, it's pretty darn hot. <laughs> uh, say, fantastic airplane, it really was. The, uh, it, there was a lot of work and a lot of problems, but we worked well together. The Lockheed team was amazing. Same with the engine people. They were all one team, true in the truest sense. Uh, primary example, Kelly Johnson was uh, once, whether we, we weren't the Lockheed test pilots, we were the project pilots. And uh, we'd complain about something we'd want thus and so to have uh, be done. You know, we didn't like the way this was done. And we'd talk to Bill Park, who was, uh, again, a formerly a very good friend and uh, just a, a damn good test pilot, Lockheed. And we'd talk to him and he'd say, hey, you got a problem? We'll talk to Kelly. Kelly came up to area, he'd deal directly with these problems. There was no middleman. He had his chief engineer with him. He said, okay, what's the problem? You dumb pilots, you know, you know, I know how you are. And we said, well, you got a problem with the fire warning lights. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, you got the switch here and two switches each, you know, left and right engine. And when that red light comes on, does that mean we eject immediately or do we, you know, do this? He says, okay, Russ, show them how those things work. And Russ gets up and he says, well, you punch the, press the light and put the switch up. No, he said, when you do, Kelly said, sit down, you proved their point, fix it. <laughs> <clears throat> he said, well, you know, we, we have another small problem. We'd like to see what the contrails, if we're making contrails at 80, 90,000 feet, which 99% of the time you never will make a contrail because there's not that much up there. Uh, 
But we did have a switch that was called dump switch, and you could dump all the fuel. That, to me, was very dumb switch, not dump. So that you could dump all your fuel out. And I thought, well, you know, if you dumped a little bit of it for whatever reason, or you had some leaking out, it just plumed out at that altitude. It was like a huge contrail. So we said, we'd like to have a periscope in the canopy. And well, everything's titanium. You know, I mean, some of it was composite on the skin and the chai and so forth, but titanium basically. They said, engineers said, no, we can't do that. We can't do that. It'll burn off. You know, it's too hot up there. Burn off. Two months later, you know, we mentioned to Kelly Johnson, two months later, we had a periscope. And we could look left, right engine. If we had a problem, you could see it. Uh, <clears throat> flying this airplane was just a privilege and an honor. Really was. It was amazing. Uh, some of us got the hell scared out of us frequently. Uh, we did lose, unfortunately, a few people. Uh, but basically, the airplane was good, and the, the communications we had with Lockheed and Kelly Johnson and the, the test pilots and uh, the guys at Jean Potit, you know, and, and protecting us, we had a number of uh, what we called defensive equipment on there. The A-12 was a single cockpit SR-71. We didn't have another guy in the back seat. And uh, I said the reason they put the guy in the back seat is like SAC. That, it was a SAC airplane, strategic air command. And uh, if they ever went down an ice cap, you know, they had to have somebody to eat. <laughs> we, did, we didn't figure we were going that direction. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> The uh, interesting thing about it is uh, the temperatures, and people didn't really know anything about it uh, until we started doing this, uh, flying at these altitudes. The temperatures varied. We ran into hot pockets of air, and that would slow you down. And you could see it in your airspeed, and your Mach number would start decreasing. Well, you didn't want it to decrease because you're going to lose altitude. And if it did, you know, you just, you had to, put those down so you kept your mock up. We had one of the missions uh, over North Korea where, the, the, I've, as I said, I flew my combat missions in uh, North Korea during the war. The temperatures in the uh, jet streams were amazing up there. They had 300 knot jet streams over North Korea. And the temperatures with the high jet streams seemed to increase. And Jack was, came, went in about 80,000 feet Fortunately, uh, North Korea is not very wide, and he was on a mission, and uh, the temperature increased. He had high jet stream, and he actually dropped down to just about 65,000 feet just to keep his mock up. And uh, that could have been very serious had they been more alert, and they could have shot him down. Mm -hmm. It didn't happen, but anyway. But those are the kinds of things we have. Uh, everything was invented uh, on this airplane. They, they had electrical components. You'd go up and fly a hot mission, hot meaning Mach 3 plus, and the A-12 could get out to Mach 3.3 and 95,000 feet. It was a little bit lighter, a little bit shorter than the SR-71. Uh, the, these, these kinds of things were something you had to contend with, and Lockheed stepped up to it and, and did a very fine job. And of course, Kelly Johnson was the man and he, he was the leader, and, uh, but he had some excellent people that worked with him. Thanks, Ken. <clears throat> the third part of the story, we've heard about aviation, about engineering. We'll spend just a few quick minutes because we want to leave time for questions, is intelligence. What was the aircraft supposed to be used for as an intelligence collection platform? It is, after all, being sent into hostile territory to take photography of various kinds of tact hopefully tactical uh, targets. Uh, it was originally designed, as indicated here, for strategic missions. None of those ever panned out. And by the time it became operational in late 1965, it's only North Vietnam, really, that is uh, the, the crucial question at the time that this capability would uh, be useful for. And so Operation Black Shield, as it was codenamed, is fashioned. It lasted for a little under a year, 29 missions, 26 of them over the Indochina area, three prompted by the seizure of the Pueblo in January of 1968 over North Korea, all staged out of Kadena with the support of the Air Force there, the 1129th, 
And it was a, an intricate process of getting uh, aircraft in and out, uh, pilots in and out, but it worked uh, amazingly. 27 of the 29 missions were deemed operationally successful. One of the ones other than that were partially successful. None of them was because of an aircraft problem. One of them was because the camera winked out halfway through. Another failure was because of unexpected cloud cover over target. The first mission prompted by concerns that the North Vietnamese had acquired surface-to-surface -surface missiles and might be starting to lob them onto Saigon and parts of the South, uh, that would have changed the tenor of the war drastically. So the initial scramble for the A-12 was to find these. Very quickly, using the, the photography gathered from the missions, uh, a camera, the Type 1 was the only one used on the 29 missions, a resolution of 12 inches, which is plenty good enough for uh, photo interpreters to do their business, find what they're looking for, analyze it, send it back to uh, the warfighters, the policy makers. The imagery was amazingly clear. It could be uh, readily used by the photo interpreters. Some of them deployed to uh, Japan to provide quick turnaround for the material. I hope we'll have a little chance during the Q&A to talk with one of our photo interpreters here who worked with this kind of material to count enemy surface-to-air missile emplacements, troop deployments, troop movements, bomb damage assessment, targeting possibilities. Uh, the, the imagery analysis was really kind of the heart and soul of the intelligence picture. Picture. The collection itself is neat to hear about, but you have to have people to make sense of what the cameras are taking. And pretty soon we had a good read on what the communist government there was doing, and we could protect their pilots on their bombing runs. There are many pilots uh, alive today or who lived through the war courtesy of the intelligence analysis performed by the A-12 uh, PIs. North Korea comes on the scope because of the seizure of the Pueblo. It's a uh, potentially uh, catastrophic uh, or certainly a, uh, a very serious international incident. Could have led to armed conflict. We needed to know if the North Koreans were uh, ramping up their military, engaging in some kind of hostile preparation. And additionally, because they were lying about where the Pueblo was, it was important for us to find it. And sure enough, on that first mission, we did. Here it is in Wonsan Harbor. Uh, we were able to identify it because we had uh, collateral intelligence about the North Korean uh, ships who were around there. We knew, of course, what the Pueblo itself looked like, so we could read what this image uh, indicated. And pretty soon at this point, the Johnson administration is able to catch the North Koreans in a flat-out lie. Protracted diplomatic negotiations ensue. Eleven months later, the surviving crew members are returned. The Pueblo itself remains in uh, North Korea as a propaganda trophy. Uh, if you, uh, you ever get into North Korea, you can go there and tour uh, the aircraft, but don't bet on that anytime soon. Ironically, the program, the Oxcart program, the A-12 program, is decommissioned uh, less than uh, 11 months after it becomes fully operational. It's a kind of an inside the beltway story about interagency infighting, budget cutters, bean counters, uh, rice bowl issues. Uh, I want to have the, take over the program, run it as a tactical military uh, program. And it, in a sense, made sense. Uh, why, what was the reason to have a covert program run by a civilian intelligence organization when you're really collecting military tactical intelligence in a, on a battlefield? It did make sense in that, from that standpoint to turn the program over to the military. And so by this time, the SR-71 is flying. It had had a longer development life than the A-12, a few more problems because it's a more complicated aircraft, more sensors, design issues to take into account the fact that it's heavier and has to fly farther, carries more fuel, it's longer, and so forth. But eventually it comes online, flies its first mission in March of 68, also out of Kadena. And meanwhile, the A-12s are figuratively uh, sent back home, boxed up, put in mothballs, and they remain there uh, for uh, until the 1990s when they're gradually turned over to museums. We also want to mention briefly a third aircraft that came out of the Oxcart program. It's pictured here in the middle. It's called the YF-12A. This was an interesting concept, creating a supersonic fighter interceptor that would fly toward incoming Soviet supersonic bombers before they got into our danger zone. Three of these were built. The program never became fully operational, was overtaken by another one. The YF-12, though, is interesting in the history of the Oxcart program because it was first the one aircraft within the program that was surfaced, that was made public. 
the Johnson administration eventually realized that somehow this covert program was going to be exposed under circumstances it couldn't control, a crash, an inadvertent sighting, and so forth. We already knew that some journalists were on the case, uh, on the story, and so Johnson decides to take a, an obvious candidate within the program, a tactical military strike fighter, and surface it. So the YF-12 becomes, uh, with the uh, interesting name A-11, the overt side of the program. It's also the first Oxcart family member to set a world speed record, 2150 uh, in uh, 1965. And it was only the first of many Oxcart records. I'll run through real quickly, uh, because it's uh, an essential part of the legacy story here about the SR-71 program, and perhaps again during the Q&A we can go into it in more detail. Some of you uh, may confuse the aircraft, uh, as you can see here by looking at them head on, and this is the only place uh, where you'll find two of them side by side, it's in Palmdale Air Park in California. It's pretty obvious the design differences, and they're explainable by the different missions of the aircraft and the uh, aerodynamic needs for flying a heavier uh, aircraft that's uh, flying a farther mission, carries more fuel, uh, and so forth. Uh, we have still people around who confuse the two. They refer to the A-12 Blackbird. I'm ashamed to say that one of our senior agency officials recently referred to the aircraft that we have at headquarters as our SR-71. Uh, we have since re-educated her, and she won't make that mistake again. The SR-71 was, as I say, the legacy aircraft deployed to really provide worldwide coverage and over the course of its uh, career here of the better part of a uh, quarter century, it is flying about 3,500 missions worldwide. It's based at Beale Air Force Base in California for certain kinds of missions that are convenient to the uh, United States area. Sorties flown out of RAF Milden Hall uh, are crucial in dealing with various kinds of intelligence collection, especially the Navy. They were very keen on the collection that the uh, SR-71 made on, on Soviet and other naval targets. It was used during the uh, conflict with Libya during the 1980s. And the missions flown out of Okinawa include a variety of targets, again, uh, those especially against the uh, Soviet Union, very valuable to uh, the U.S. Navy. So what do we have here? Uh, a combination of aviation, engineering, intelligence, all working together, uh, contractors, the military, uh, the civilian intelligence uh, organization, combining to create a remarkable aircraft. You've heard about it from the people who know it best tonight. Uh, it's a very successful mission. Uh, it provided timely intelligence in ways that satellites and spies could not. An indispensable part, I think, as I hope you appreciate now, of American aviation engineering uh, and intelligence history. And its legacy lives on in many of the technological advancements, some of which you've heard about today uh, in electronics and aviation. Uh, a remarkable aircraft, one that I'm finally proud to be able to talk about in public because of the declassification of the program in 2007 combined with the declassification of about 1,500 pages of documents that you can read on the CIA's public website, CIA.gov, and in our official history of the aircraft, which is posted there. And there are numerous books about the SR-71 uh, also available uh, in the public domain. So I hope we've uh, stimulated your appetite for learning more about it. Uh, and we'll turn it over to questions, but before I do, I wanted to recognize here a couple of members of our Roadrunners organization. Uh, who have accompanied our guest speakers here tonight. They played important roles in the program, and I'd like to uh, take this opportunity to recognize them uh, publicly. First, uh, T.D. Barnes, uh, please stand up and, and be acknowledged. T.D. was an electronics engineer who worked on the radar spoofing programs, uh, electronic countermeasures. Uh, we've heard alluded to here the fact that the aircraft was equipped with certain kinds of electronic countermeasures to spoof radar, to warn it that it was being painted, uh, to uh, uh, spoof incoming SAMs, and a lot of the work on that uh, is the credit of, of TD and his colleagues. Roger Anderson, please. Roger was uh, a support officer working at the uh, Nevada test site and in Okinawa. Uh, and he, like many, many others, did uh, essential support roles uh, that helped the program succeed. Dennis Nordquist was a 
uh, colleague on the uh, engine program, uh, another uh, stellar engineer who helped work on the, uh, the J-58 and the, and the special fuels. Uh, Arthur Biedler uh, here was one of the photo interpreters forward deployed to Japan who helped read out uh, some of that mission footage. Uh, we have Rich Graham, uh, SR-71 pilot, and uh, he's uh, written a number of books about it that uh, I, I hope you'll uh, take a look at. Uh, who am I missing down here? Um, Buzz Carpenter, of course. Uh, Buzz, uh, you're familiar as a, if you're an air and space regular, uh, one of the docents here, uh, and also one of the SR-71 pilots with uh, a remarkable career in that regard. Well, question time. Uh, what, what would you like to know more from uh, me and uh, more importantly from uh, the people who lived it? Yes, sir. Straight ahead, yes. Great. Uh, uh, thanks for the great lecture. Really appreciate it. Thanks. Uh, two questions. Uh, why was it painted black instead of a color that matched the sky? And, uh, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, Gene, how about if you, you take the paint question because it's related to stealth, and of course, Ken, you take the, uh, uh, the uh, firing question. Could you repeat the question? Yes, the question was, why is it painted black, and was it ever shot at? We know it was never shot down, but did anybody ever uh, put it in harm's way? Let's put it that way. The first uh, question is that uh, the sky at 95,000 feet is pretty black. And we had the experience of the U-2 uh, color schemes, so we built on that experience. But uh, believe me, it uh, turns out that black is harder, more difficult to see than any other color. It's, it's black up there. Excuse me, but the real reason is it lowered the temperature of the airplane 50 degrees. Thank you. It helped, yes, yeah. it was loaded, yes. Mm -hmm. it, the black did help the absorbing radar capability of mm -hmm. it. And uh, <clears throat> it all depends where you're sitting as to whether or not someone's shooting at you. <laughs> and uh, there's always, you know, uh, there's always little technical problems and differences and so forth. Uh, was it shot at? Yes. Uh, Denny Sullivan, one of uh, my good friends who isn't with us tonight, uh, he's here, but not here. Uh, he got uh, missiles fired and just a piece of the plumbing. They, they never came that close because we were too high and too fast, and a little piece of shrapnel went into what we call the turkey feathers of the back part of the afterburner. Uh, didn't do any serious damage at all, and none of them, SR-71 or the A-12, were, you know, seriously threatened by missiles. Anyway. Yes, sir. That young man up there. Talk about that I can't hear what he said. Did the Blackbird ever fly 20,000 feet? 20,000 feet? It could get up to 90,000 and above. We fly 80,000 to 90 some thousand above. Mm -hmm. That's a bit more than 20,000. Most of your commercial airliners fly at 35,000, 35 yeah. to 40,000 feet. Okay. It, 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 its routine mission uh, altitude was uh, 80 to 85, yeah. There was a, someone fired a question about the drones. I do want to talk about that real briefly and I'll, and I'll take the next question. The, the drone program was a, a short-lived one. It was a, a highly complicated uh, concept here. You're, you're taking a drone that you're going to use as, a, as an unmanned uh, reconnaissance vehicle over denied territory that you cannot overfly with the aircraft because the distances are too great, like communist China, the interior of the Soviet Union. Recall on the one map, the aerial refueling pattern simply wouldn't work because you couldn't get the tankers close enough. So the drone program is fashioned. You have a drone attached to the top of an A-12, which is now outfitted with, as a two-seater, so you have a systems control officer to, to run the drone aspect of it. The A-12 is brought up to cruising speed, and then the drone is released and sent off at an even faster speed, up to 3.5 Mach. It's programmed with a computer to fly a predetermined course. It takes its pictures, also according to a computer-programmed uh, system, and then it flies out over the ocean, drops the canister 
parachute pops up, it's snagged by a boxcar aircraft, just like the Corona satellites were later on, and the, air, the drone gradually descends to Earth and blows up with a barometric pressure uh, detonator. Kelly Johnson canceled the program after, I think, the second test when, fourth, fourth test, excuse me, when uh, the drone lifted off and then fell back onto the top of the aircraft, causing it to crash. Both the crew punched out, the systems officer died in, uh, the, in the crash, or rather he, he uh, ditched in the ocean and drowned. Uh, and as a result, Kelly was so upset, he just canceled the program. It was taken over by the Defense Department. They experimented with putting it on the wings of B-52s. They flew four missions, uh, sending it over to communist China. Didn't really work quite right. Technology didn't work. Cameras didn't work. And it, too, was canceled in, in 1971. It was kind of a uh, technological reach uh, a bit too far. Yes, sir. I would like to I can add something to that. Perhaps others can clarify it. But the small team of CIA engineers, they worked on the projects. It turned out the Corona, the U-2, and the A-12 Oxcart were all managed out of the same small CIA office. We were, we were our own version of the skunk works. Mm -hmm. I don't think there was ever more than six or eight of us in the, on the CIA side at all. Yes, sir, down front. I had heard a story once that uh, it was possible, it, I guess there would be a blip if, if a, a radar operator caught something, they could relay it to the next section, and they would launch immediately. A rocket could get up to altitude and potentially be a threat. Is that just a theory, or was that something that needs to be concerning? Well, they shot over a 1,000 missiles during these, and... Uh, yeah. uh, the question is, was there a a system by which the radars uh, would paint the aircraft and render them vulnerable. How often were they shot at? Was, a, was this really uh, a, a threat to them? Well, you know, that's, we were only the pilots, and <laughs> we didn't get fed all the information, but they had a system if I, that I recall called Mad Moth, and supposedly on the radar screen when they locked on or picked, on, picked up the SR-71 or any of the aircraft, the, this thing would go all over their screen and you couldn't track it. Mm -hmm. But it, it ended up there was always a tail to this that they found out later, we found out later. At, actually, they could track the tail. They didn't find this mad, mad moth running around here on their, their radar, but they did. So they shut that thing down and they changed it. I, we probably in the... The year that we were, uh, the A-12 was in Okinawa flying missions. They, uh, they probably changed the <laughs> defensive equipment three or four times. Yeah. Uh, way in the top there, sir. Well, I, I uh, what, if, what if the Soviets had done this to us is, uh, is the bottom line question here. Um, <laughs> We'd probably try to shoot them down too, too but uh, yeah. if they were that successful, they never had an airplane that could yeah. even get anywhere near the A-12 or the SR-71. Mm -hmm. Now, did they have a missile at that time that could get near the A-12 or the SR-71? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the closest they got, I, as I understand it, was taking a fox bat uh, fighter and, and stripping it down and souping it up, but it's it's a non-operational vehicle. It's like kind of uh, flying in a drag racer. Uh, it's kind of pointless. It can only do a quarter mile before it's uh, right. it's pretty pointless. Yeah. Uh, the, the marvel about this aircraft is that it could do this Mach 3 cruise for three four hours straight. Uh, it was it was no problem to to fly it uh, for that distance with shutdowns for refuelings and such. Uh, no, no other aircraft has ever been able to sustain that kind of speed and, and altitude for, for that period of time. Yeah. Sir? Yeah, what was the design decision to go to the two pilot or two crew member configuration from a single crew member configuration? <laughs> other, other than eating for a second. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I really don't know. I think uh, I felt, of course, uh, 
that we had everything we needed in the A-12. Uh, that was, <clears throat> the SR-71 was the Strategic Air Command that doesn't exist anymore. Uh, it was their operation and they set up and they had the parameters and they decided that they needed someone in the back seat to help handle systems. Rich, you think? That makes sense. Yeah, that's, that's about, it was just a matter of philosophy of operation. Yeah, keep in mind that the SR has multiple collectors. The, the A-12 was only a photographic platform, though it could be equipped with these other sensors, but only one at a time. The SR could carry them uh, more than one at a time. It could do imagery, it could do uh, radar, it could do ELINT collection, <coughs> and it, was, uh, it required somebody to run the systems. It was a tough enough job to fly it. The cameras were essentially an on-off switch. Uh, even a pilot could manage that. Well, uh, so. <laughs> wait, wait, wait a minute. That's, uh, well, that might be true. <laughs> the, the cameras were turned on and off by the inertial navigation system. Seriously, we had an override capability, but the, the, the inertial navigation system was better than the pilot yeah. or the backseater in the SI-71. Okay. It pointed, it turned it on okay. time, it did everything it was supposed to yeah. do. Let me add to what Ken just said. The SR-71 had a unique mission that helped justify its continued existence, and that mission was called post-strike reconnaissance. In other words, if there were to be a nuclear war, uh, it was the SR-71 that would have to go and see if, the, if you got all the targets or did you need to fire other missiles for a second strike. And it was a tough, more, it was a tough environment. It took a lot of different types of sensors for that particular job, such as the synthetic aperture radar and so on. But it was a post-strike mission that, that required all the extra sensors <coughs> and therefore an operator. <coughs> Peter. Ken, uh, tell people what you did if you started running low on fuel. What would you do if you were the pilot and you started to notice that the gauge that was heading toward come the from? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, Peter? Yeah. What? Well, oh, you're, you're talking about air to air refueling? Oh, well, yeah, that was, well, air to air refueling, of course, for most pilots or Air Force pilots, it's a it's sort of piece of cake kind of thing. You have a tanker, and the tanker, but the thing unique about our tankers is that we had Delta fuel for the SR and the A A12. It was, a, I wouldn't say caustic, but that's sort of the best word I could think of. They had to have special plumbing, all glass lined tubing and it was, took that special tanker, and you'd come down to 30, 33,000 feet altitude and come in and plug into the boom. They'd give you fuel, it took about 20 minutes to get a full fuel load. After that, you'd drop off, light the afterburners, and head out back up, climb back up to 85,000 feet in Mach 3. So, and that was done, uh, uh, well, we did it every time we flew. Uh, in fact, one of the, uh, the Vietnamese, uh, North Vietnam mission, We'd fly down, go through North Vietnam, do our photo take, descend down near Bangkok, Thailand, refuel there, turn around and come back up, make another run through, and then head back to uh, Okinawa, the Kadena Air Base. I'd like to uh, call Arthur Beadler up to the microphone, if you don't mind, please. Arthur, as I've identified already, was one of the photo interpreters who worked in Japan. And I, I'd like him to take a couple of minutes, uh, we're, we're getting close to 9 o'clock here, but to describe what exactly a photo interpreter did with that imagery, what, what kind of the, the craft of photo interpretation was, how it got to the uh, war fighters in the battlefield, how we made sense, really, of what the aircraft was doing at 80 to 80,000 feet. Please, Art. Good evening. I was assigned to the uh, 67th Reconnaissance Technical Squadron at Yokota Air Base and uh, as just part of one of the many PIs and photo lab personnel that manned the squadron. When we got word that, uh, and I'll go to the, uh, right to the Pueblo thing because that was really extraordinary. When we got word that the um, a mission was coming in uh, by back channel communications, um, it was downloaded at Kadena, immediately flown to uh, Japan, and we received it. It was processed, and then the PIs got it. They got uh, how they did their job and why they were able to do things so fast was because we had developed a system where we took the, uh, the INS information and we plugged it into a computer, 
And there was a trace. We knew exactly where the aircraft flew. And when the film arrived on the PI floor, the PI was told he knew exactly what frame he had to look at and how far off Nader he could find his target. Uh, the camera was the Elmer Type 1, uh, Elmer Perkins. It was an extremely good camera. That particular mission, um, the, uh, his superiors over and they confirmed that it was. And uh, they sent out the flash message to Washington. We found the Pueblo. Um, that mission and what the PIs were able to do off of that mission was almost completely update the database of targets. And when I say targets, these are a reconnaissance objectives. We're not bombing anything. We just want to find out about it. That particular database hadn't been updated since 1954 at the end of the Korean War. That mission, that, that uh, 6847 Black Shield, was the best mission we had. We worked for weeks and weeks and weeks and updated things. And even NPIC said, the 67th seems to have gotten most of it. <laughs> we didn't really have too much to add. For PI, looking at imagery from the um, A-12, wasn't really any different, except in quality, than doing anything else. For as a PI, you had to know your area. You studied, went to school for six to eight weeks, and you learned how to identify different orders of battle, tanks, aircraft, et cetera, ships. And then you, when you got to where you're going to be working in the world, you learned the area. The area you were responsible for, if you knew your area, then you could see whether anything was different. And part of the criticality of a PI's work was being at able to identify things by key significant factors. What was the shape of it? What was the size of it? Were the shadows involved? What was the angle that you saw it at? And most of all, was it logical for it to be there? And, and you learned these things, and you were able to um, make your judgments based on that. Photo interpretation, imagery interpretation nowadays is an art. It is not a science. So the more you learn about your area and what you're supposed to be looking at, the better you are and you can do your job. Thank you. Thank you. OK, maybe time for three more questions, I'd say. One more question, OK. <laughs> um, let me, OK, straight up in the middle. The man who just stood up, right. Would you mind repeating the question, please? Yes. Uh, was the concept, was the term stealth used back at the time you were working on this program, or is that a nomenclature that was developed later? We used it extensively when I was on the program in the early 1960s, but I'm sorry, I don't know whether it was used by the Germans or not. I don't think they used the equivalent to that, but I'm not certain. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thanks, Gene. Um, I'm fine with going on, but if you want to uh, send everybody home, I, it's good, good to meet you. Okay. We still got more with the autographs. Okay, that's true. All right. Thanks. All right. Thanks very much. Well, on behalf of the Smithsonian, we'd like to thank Dr. Robarge and the uh, panel for tonight's insights. But most of all, we'd like to thank you for your service to your country. <clears throat> for you in the audience, uh, you were offered a, a questionnaire when you came in, and we're very interested in what you think about our programs. If you give us an indication, if you take the time to fill it out and let us know what you'd like to see, then we try to tailor the programs to your interests. So, uh, so please take that time to, uh, on the way out. Our panelists will be available out by the welcome desk for autographs, and Rich Graham will be there uh, with, to sign his books. 
The, uh, if you'll exit via the rear of the theater, you'll be on the right floor and the, uh, the Welcome Center is out there on your right. Thanks very much for coming this evening. Hope to see you at our next event. Thank you.